reading. Now, sight reading is not something I am naturally good at. I've had to work hard at it. But one thing I've noticed from teaching, I have never seen. I've mentioned before in other vlogs how great I find the Bach cello suites just to, first of all, listen to as a musical work, but as a practice tool, as a saxophone player, I think they're incredible. This book, by, transcribed by Trent Kynston, fantastic version. That is in a different key though, so I've had to use uh, transcribe just to drop it down four semitones, and it's a lot slower than the minimum. I think I'm at 60% there of the real speed, because it's just like a full speed. <laughs> It's fantastic. I'm sorry, you won't find a better workout in C minor in any other book. And this is something that um, is worth remembering. You know, I said in the other vlog about uh, education, jazz education particularly. You know, people have been teaching musical instruments years before we had method books. I briefly wanted to talk today with today's title about sight reading. Now, sight reading is not something I am naturally good at. I've had to work hard at it. But one thing I've noticed from teaching, I have never seen on any of my students' mark sheets or other students' mark sheets, to be fair, that I've actually seen a high scale mark and a low sight reading mark. I've seen plenty of low scale marks and low sight reading marks, okay, but I've never seen those two. Normally people who have good knowledge of scales and have their scales together are able to sight read. And the reason for that is you're able to you're able to use more of your brain power on working out the rhythms because the notes seem to just flow when you're in certain keys. And there was a video that Ron recommended in one of the comments, I'll try and link it below, to a professor, a piano professor, I just glanced at it last night, and he was saying two, two major things. First of all, something I don't do enough in my practice, which is, now, pianists have to do this more often in their job than, than saxophone players do, but I don't sight read every day, and I should do it. I'm going to try and get back into that, but he recommends sight reading something 15 minutes every day. He talks about grabbing a hymnal. That's going to be different for us saxophone players, but there's, there are plenty of books out there you can grab with sight reading exercises. You know, um, the two I'm going to use today, uh, the Associated Board Specimen Sight Reading Test, you know, there's loads in there, and this book. This is probably one of the few textbooks I still use from when I was at college. It's one of the Joe Viola books. It's the Creative Reading Studies. There's a lot of them. There's another one I was looking for before, but I can't find, called Reading Jazz for Tenor Saxophone or something. I can't remember what it's called, but it's really useful to do. Another thing to do are the Gordon Goodwin Big Band um, arrangements uh, where you're kind of like music minus one so you're kind of you can play the lead tenor part or the lead alto part if I'm but if I have a big band gig coming up or something like that and I know I need to read one of the things I'll often do is I'll pull out some of those Gordon Goodwin pieces and I'll just sight read or read back through those just to make sure I'm familiar with those different rhythms one of the great things in this Joe Viola book is the fact it starts off with kind of one rhythmic pattern and it can you're supposed to continue that rhythmic pattern until you see a new one so if you see here you've got um, crotchet, sorry, quaver triplets, that's eighth note triplets for those of you who don't work in that method. And then we're on to like a swung triplet in the middle, so you've got to keep that going all the way through. It keeps you in mind of the rhythm while reading the notes. And these kind of exercises here in 3 8, you know, re I'm going to give that a shot now. They're really, really useful to do um, just to keep your eye moving, get, keeping that use of reading rhythm, because actually, most of the time, as long as you've got the scale, in your, under your fingers, it's it's getting the rhythm down. Most students that I've experienced over 15, 20 years of teaching, the biggest issue is they don't have the notes down. So they, they, they just don't have enough RAM is the best analogy I can use where they can basically concentrate on reading the notes and doing that. The other analogy I like to use is when you're learning to drive, um, you know, you're turning right in England into a box junction. I'm sorry, I can't, you're probably left in the States or in other countries. But it's, it's effectively in, in the UK, you know, you, this, the tutor will take you out on the road, you're confident enough in driving. You'll then get, it'll talk you through moving into, a, or she will talk you through driving into a box junction. And you basically, you're in the box junction, you're watching all the traffic coming towards you, you see a gap, you're ready to go, bang, you stole the car. Because you just haven't got enough muscle memory there in the clutch 
to be able to operate the clutch without thinking about it. And I, I find that's a good analogy for sight reading. You have to have your scales down like your clutch. You just have to have it so good that you can fully concentrate on reading the rhythm and allow the notes to come through. I am a big believer though in practicing what is necessary, what you're going to come across. Whilst it's great fun to practice things in, you know, complicated rhythms in 5A, I can count on the fingers of one hand the number of times I've been asked to do that. It's symptomatic of what we find in academia, there's a lot of stuff that 90% of the time you're never going to use and they make use of the 3% of people that are going to play that. But the bark stuff is fantastic and you're going to keep coming across music that has a relationship to bark over and over and over and over again. Anyway, my glue gun finally arrived, so I need to finish off this repair to the drone, so I'm going to do that now. There's one thing I've not really got totally used to yet, even after doing it for 20 years. It's working Saturdays and Sundays sometimes as well. I mean, you know, it's just the way it has to be. Saturday is such a day that people want to have lessons, gigs, you know, music schools, all those kind of things take place on a Saturday. And I don't want to teach in mainstream education, so I have to kind of understand that this is the nature of the beast. And obviously gigs always tend to be Friday, Saturdays. Um, it's just mainly what's cropped into my mind is there's a, a WhatsApp group I'm in for some of the lads in the village and we're kind of trying to plan our Christmas sort of Christmas night out basically and, and kind of trying to move things around and everyone and those guys that kind of work Monday to Friday it's really easy for them to kind of schedule things in they just pick an evening off they go whereas whilst I don't do anywhere near the amount of gigs in December that I used to um, that's through personal choice um, it's just, you know, it's difficult sometimes. I mean, I'm not looking for a cry of sympathy. I understand I've got a job that a lot of people would love to be able to afford to have, um, but I'd love not to have to work as many Saturdays. Uh, but then when I look at an adult, kind of what I would lose if I didn't work Saturdays, um, you know, it's a big chunk of my week I can earn on a Saturday. So um, one of those things, it's got harder as my kids get older. We try and block out Saturday afternoons after I get back from teaching at Guildhall. So from kind of three o'clock, that's family time. And we try and make sure we do things as a family. The problem is that there's when all the really good sport tends to be on because the England v Australia rugby's on this afternoon. And then uh, plus Man United Newcastle's on at 5.30. But, you know, that's what Sky Plus was invented for. Just been teaching this the chicken great a Wee ellis tune actually but made famous of course by jacko really but the birthday concert i was making him listen to it and just made me appreciate again all over again what a wonderful wonderful saxophone player mike brecker was uh, i need to do a vlog about it i mean i'll, I'll tell you I'll, I'll kind of make the vlog on that but for me the best technician of the uh, technical player of the saxophone I think ever. I think he moved beyond where Coltrane was, but that's subject for another vlog. You can keep all the comments till then. But and I'm gonna I'll have to do a play this and stuff for Brecker. Just I don't listen enough to him because he is he isn't necessarily always easy to listen to. Um, you know, you definitely there's just so many killer lines in his playing. He's kinda like what Chris Potter is to the YouTube generation, do you get what I mean? Anyway, home, and we're going to take the kids to see Paddington 2.